Welcome to lecture 10 of Introduction to Computer Architecture. My name is Simon Moore and today I'm going to tell you about other instruction sets including historic machines, complex instruction set computers and finishing with uh, a research uh, instruction set uh, architecture called Cherry that we're developing in Cambridge at the moment. Professor Morris Wilkes was the driving force behind EDSAC, a computer developed in Cambridge in the 1940s. It was the world's first fully operational stored program computer, that is, the first fully working computer that stored its instructions in its own memory rather than externally on a tape or a panel of switches. Wilkes's vision was that EDSAC would be used by other scientists other than being just a research machine for computer scientists. And in fact, EDSAC helped Cambridge to win two Nobel Prizes through the dramatic speed up it offered in processing of data. It ran at uh, around 650 instructions per second. That's about one ten millionth of the speed of modern computers. It had only about one kilobyte of memory, but despite its incredible limitations by today's standard, it still got an amazing amount of work done. And when you compare it to doing calculations by hand uh, or using a sort of cranked mechanical uh, calculating machine, it was an incredible step forward. The original EDSAC machine was actually broken up and turned into EDSAC 2, a completely new research machine. So actually there's very little of the original machine uh, left over. There's actually a uh, substantial project going uh, on at TNMOC, that's the National Museum of uh, Computing Machines, uh, based at Bletchley Park, where a team of volunteers is reconstructing EDSAC from uh, old circuit diagrams and drawings and photographs, because it turns out there wasn't really a very accurate record of uh, what the EDSAC machine was in part because it was a research machine which they kept tinkering with. So there was never really one version of EDSAC. It was in many ways, you know, a machine that sort of started to work and then they uh, tinkered with it further and extended it and, you know, added to my own devices and various other things. The EDSAC project started in 1947 and ran its first programme in 1949. The project lead was Professor Sir Maurice Wilkes. Um, he was quite an interesting character. He always liked to look forward, he was always interested in the next greatest thing and in fact one of the challenges they had when they started the EDSAC rebuild project is Morris was still alive and basically he was vehemently against them rebuilding his machine because he always liked to look forward, which is an interesting trait. Uh, Morris had actually worked on radar during the war and in some sense that was an advantage Firstly, he knew a lot about uh, valves and mercury delay lines and things which were used for storage. Um, but also, unlike people who'd worked at Bletchley Park, he was actually unaware of secret machines like Colossus. And therefore, uh, the UK government and secret services were happy for Morris to work on this new machine because they knew he couldn't possibly leak secret information because he was simply unaware of um, those very early machines. Input and output was via paper tape, uh, teleprinter and switches. So these were devices that were already used uh, for wired telegraph systems rather than computers. He used mercury delay lines for storage. This is where you send uh, pulses, actually in the form of solitons, down mercury delay lines. Uh, they get these pulses get picked up at the end of the delay line, amplified and fed back in. And if you do that in a very stable manner, you can actually uh, form a memory. Morris had actually used mercury delay lines in the war uh, when he was working um, on radar because they were actually used for echo cancellation. So basically when you were doing a radar sweep, you would put the radar uh, sweep data into a mercury delay line and then the next time you do a sweep, you actually subtract um, what was in the delay line from what you received. And therefore, 
all that appears on the radar screen are things that are moving, so it gets rid of a lot of clutter. Um, the logic technology was valves, so um, also referred to as vacuum tubes. So these were uh, thermionic valves. There's actually sort of a heater in the base and a control gate. So they consume quite a lot of power and um, can be a little bit unreliable or generally pretty good if you leave them on all the time. Uh, the speed was of the order of uh, 714 uh, operations per second, per second. As you've seen from the previous photograph, the footprint of the computer was sort of a medium-sized room. Uh, but as I've already said, it was widely used in Cambridge to do scientific computations, some of which were linked to Nobel Prizes. The EDSAT instruction set is actually fairly straightforward, but actually is pretty usable. Um, the basic idea is that uh, you have a, a memory, um, which is just linearly addressable as normal, and you have one accumulator that's used for most of the calculation, and I've referred to that as ACC. Uh, so you don't have a register file as such, you just have an accumulator. It also does have a, uh, a separate register used for multiplications. So let's run down the instruction set. So the first one is P, which is a pseudo instruction, and this is just used for constants. Uh, so the actual opcode is just zero, so it just represents a constant. We have A for add, S for subtract, H for initialize the multiplier. So this is where it reads something from memory and puts it in the multiplier register. Um, just coming back to add and subtract, add, uh, read something from memory, add it to the accumulator, and uh, then stores it back in the accumulator and subtract basically does the same thing except the operation is subtract rather than add. We've got uh, multiply and add and multiply and subtract which are also very similar but nevertheless these are fairly complex operations you know this multiplier actually uh, had to uh, iterate uh, several times to complete the operation. Then we've got T which is a store and clear accumulator instruction so the idea here really is, you know, you're co copying the accumulator into memory and then erasing it, ready to do the next bit of program. Uh, and we have a, a variant of this which simply stores the accumulator to memory without clearing it. Then there's the C instruction, which is a bitwise AND operation. And then we have operations to do shifts. So there's left shift and right shift. We've got some conditional branches, uh, which basically update the program counter with a, a value that directly points to uh, the branch points. So this is not a relative jump, it's an absolute jump. Um, to read from the punch paper tape, there was a specific instruction. These days, you know, we tend to map input-output devices directly into memory, but in EDSAC there were specific instructions. So we basically wait for input uh, from uh, punch paper tape. O is uh, output to the top five bits uh, to the teleprinter. Um, F was to read the next output character, which apparently was used, well, could have been used for sort of error detection, but apparently it was never used in practice, so I'm told. Um, and finally, there's some rounding instructions. Uh, you can actually represent data as 16-bit or 34-bit uh, values. And finally, somewhat amusingly, there's the Z instruction, which stops the machine and rings the bell to tell you that it's finished. So a few observations about EDSAC. Well, accumulator machines like EDSAC have a huge memory churn as every instruction reads or writes data to or from memory. There are also obviously things missing from the instruction set. So a really obvious one is that there's no way of doing a subroutine. And would you believe it, at the point when EDSAC was created, nobody had invented the subroutine. And in fact, uh, David Wheeler, who subsequently became, a uh, uh, for his PhD, invented the Wheeler jump, and he subsequently became a professor in the department. Uh, his wheeler jump actually involved self-modifying code uh, to basically uh, mimic a subroutine call, uh, which is kind of cunning and slightly scary. Um, there were no interrupts. Uh, there's, of course, no virtual memory. 
there's really no rich I.O. Uh, you know, you've just got the teleprinter and you've got a bell. Um, and uh, finally, you know, the mercury made from mercury de delay lines is, you know, expensive. Uh, but still, it was a lot cheaper than using lots of valves uh, to construct the memory. So, uh, you know, they were just trying to work with the... Um, with the electronic devices that were available uh, in the day. And of course, uh, you know, uh, they were sort of limited uh, by those devices. The other thing to note, actually, before we move on to later machines, is that uh, Wilkes was involved um, during the Second World War doing radar work, which is why he knew about mercury delay lines. Interestingly, he had no idea about the code breaking activities at Bletchley Park. Uh, during the Second World War, and didn't know anything about the Colossus machine, for example, because that was a deeply kept secret. And interestingly, because Wilkes, um, you know, knew nothing about uh, the Bletchley work, uh, the security services were quite happy for him to continue to develop new computers, um, because you know there would be no link with the EdTech work with that. Uh, secret code breaking work. In contrast, uh, Tommy Flowers, who was behind Colossus at Bletchley Park, uh, he wasn't allowed to build computers, even though he wanted to, and he went on instead to uh, automate the UK telephone exchange instead. I suppose you have to pick your projects. Let's then move forward in time uh, uh, a few decades uh, to 1977. And uh, there's me sat, uh, stood in front of a Cray 1 supercomputer in the um, History Museum in Menlo Park in California. There was also one of these Cray 1s uh, in the Science Museum in London, um, but you can't get quite so close to it. Um, I find this machine quite fascinating. It's historically quite important in some of the ideas that it introduced. Um, Back in 1977, uh, the actual cost in money of that day was uh, 7.9 million US dollars, weighed, you know, 5.5 tons, consumed even more power than EDSAC at 115 kilowatts. It was a 64-bit processor running at 80 megahertz, including very powerful vector instructions. And in fact, the sort of vector instructions are... Uh, the sorts of things we see uh, graphics processing Unix GPUs using today, as well as vector extensions on conventional Intel and ARM cores. Um, it had over eight megabytes of memory, which was an awful lot at that time, and 300 megabytes of storage. It actually used a separate mini computer. Uh, note, that's the 1970s notion of a mini computer. So this is just a slightly smaller computer than a mainframe, not as today it tends to get used for things like Raspberry Pis. It's not one of those. It's uh, it's still a fairly big box. Um, but it was basically they used this uh, separate uh, commodity uh, computer to provide much of the management of the supercomputer, including a lot of the input and output. And uh, in some sense, it's almost analogous to today's GPUs. The, the Cray is a bit like the GPU, if you like, hosted by a, a low performance processor. Uh, in the case of today's PCs, you know, it's an x86-based processor uh, running uh, the conventional code and then the GPU running all the high performance calculations. Um, the Cray was actually designed by a chap called Seymour Cray. Um, and he made a couple of very interesting observations. So firstly, the performance was limited by heat removal and also the thickness of the mat, so the wiring in the machine. And uh, in fact, you could see some of the wiring in the, in the figure there. All the wiring is inside this sort of horseshoe shaped uh, device and the machine is shaped as a horseshoe to uh, allow those w wires to be minimized, but you can see there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of small blue wires. And in fact, they needed somebody quite small to get inside to do a lot of that wiring. 
One of the reasons why I find this so fascinating is really today we are also constrained by thermal limits and communication limits over the wiring. So, you know, the same problems they saw in the 1970s we still see today, even though we've shrunk things down to chips. The Cray-1 uh, had actually a sort of risk style instruction set, interestingly. It had 16 bits instructions mainly for arithmetic operations, and then it had 32 bit instructions mainly for memory operations. And as I said, fairly risk in style before the notion of risk um, had been invented. It had eight vectors, and each was uh, 64 64 bit registers to hold integers or floating point values. And the lowest 64-bit register can also be used as a scalar register. And then separately, it had eight 24-bit address registers used for memory addresses and also loop counting and things. So yeah, that's the Cray-1. Later in the 1970s uh, came along the Xerox Alto, uh, which was substantially cheaper and it's designed as a more of a personal computer, although at uh, £32,000, sorry, $32,000 in 1979 money, uh, it's still rather expensive. Um, the Alto, though, is uh, noted for being the first computer with a graphical user interface, mouse, Ethernet, laser printer, and so on. And um, it was designed by Chuck Thacker, uh, who I also got to know rather well, uh, Chuck um, was involved in setting up Microsoft Research in Cambridge and spent um, basically sort of about two or three years sort of on sabbatical in Cambridge before returning to California. The software was initially written in BCPL, which is a language uh, developed by Martin Richards, who was a lecturer in the department. Um, and they designed things including, a, a, you know, a very early WYSIWYG word processor. This system, uh, Xerox, really failed to exploit. So Xerox had done amazing things with photocopiers, and this machine was designed by their at their uh, Palo Alto uh, research facility. And Steve Jobs got to visit, and it was really a major influence on him. And he was the one who really picked up many of the ideas and turned them into the first Macintosh. Right, now let's talk about modern complex instruction set computers, which is what CISC stands for. And I say modern, well, <laughs> we actually are still in the 1970s. In fact, Intel, um, who were really known for their semiconductor manufacture, and in particular for making memory chips, they had some renegade engineers who built um, the first uh, uh, you know, a four-bit microprocessor called the 4040. Um, and that was a, a very simple four-bit machine, but it all fit on one chip. And they did that back in uh, 1974 as a bit of a sort of skunk work project. And I think a lot of people thought it was really a bit of a gimmick. And why would you want to put, you know, an entire processor on one chip? Um well, actually, I think it started getting the management thinking because uh, Intel, being based in the US, uh, they needed to have products that had a lot of intellectual property in it so that there was a significant markup uh, compared with the actual manufacturing cost. And one of the problems with the memories they were designing at the time is that, you know, memories are a very regular structure. There's not a lot of intellectual property in them. And so that, you know, really you have to sort of sell them as a very commodity item and so uh, they actually decided to basically bet the company on microprocessors back in the 1970s and in 1978 they came out with their first 16-bit instruction set architecture which is really the basis of the x86 family that we have today in uh, 19 85 they extended the 16-bit instruction set to a 32-bit instruction set originally the uh, 80386 also known as the i386 and in fact there have been a lot of distributions even today 
which support the old 386 instruction set. Okay, uh, so it's amazing, you know, how long that legacy is. They extended it to a 64-bit instruction set um, in 2003, or rather it was a bit of a, an effort by uh, AMD. At this point, um, Intel had decided that maybe this instruction set was pretty ugly, and they started designing the, a completely new 64-bit uh, instruction set. Um, but it didn't really pan out for them, and uh, AMD uh, developed a just an extension to the original instruction set that extended it out to 64-bit, and that proved to be popular. And so Intel then ended up following AMD's lead. Uh, you know, this instruction set is now widely deployed for laptops and PCs and servers, of course. As I said, it is a complex instruction set machine. It has variable length instructions, you know, 1 to uh, 15 bytes, that are highly complex to decode. Many of the registers are special purpose, although many of the extensions to the instruction set, in particular the move to 64-bit, has made the register file much more orthogonal in usage. Um, a lot of the x86 machines actually try and decode the RISC instructions into micro-operations that are similar to RISC instructions. And this is often, you know, one CISC instruction goes to many micro-operations. But there are sometimes even cases where, you know, two CISC operations get turned into one micro-operation. Despite complexity, it runs the legacy software and that's been incredibly powerful for a very long time. You know, back in the days when people had software on floppy disks and even CDs, uh, you'd want to buy a new machine and just run your old software on it without having to recompile it. It's interesting, however, you know, the rise of the App Store has really shifted the, the delivery model and it's slowly, you know, removing this dependency even for PCs uh, and, you know, IMAX, uh, and we wait to see how that pans out. Uh, the App Store delivery model, I think, is it should be noted as being highly successful in the sort of mobile phone and the tablet space. And for example, it's allowed uh, both uh, Apple and you know Google Android system to migrate people from a 32-bit processor world to a 64-bit world um, without. You know the consumer really uh, noticing too much. Let's look at the x86-64 uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, it's in 64-bit mode. There are 16 general-purpose registers. Uh, registers 0 to 7 have historic names with some specialised functionality for certain, not particularly older instructions that are still supported. So. The first uh, register is actually also labelled as an accumulator. Um, so you can use it as an accumulator machine in much the same way that you know, you'd use EDSAC. Um, then we've got the RBX instruction, which is a pointer to data in the data segment. We've got RCX, which is a counter for string and loop operations. Uh, RDX used as an I.O. pointer. RSI is a pointer to data in a segment to, pointed to by the DS register, etc. You get the idea. Uh, we also have, you know, uh, more normal things like um, a stack pointer, which is RSP, and uh, RBP, uh, which is a pointer to data on the stack. Also, registers have a sort of different names. So if we look at the uh, RAX register. Um, we have AX, which is the lower uh, 16 bits of that. Actually, within AX, we can split it into AH and AL, which are the upper and lower bytes of AX. We've got EAX, which is the 32-bit version, and then we've got RAX, which is the 64-bit version. Um, here's a list of uh, all the different registers on the machine um, and as you can see there's sort of 
8 bit and 16 bit and 32 bit and 64 bit uh, sort of va variants of different uh, registers or subsets of them. And you'll notice there's also support for uh, really big registers like 512 bit registers that have been added to support uh, vectors. That's a bit cray like. Let's look at a few instructions. Uh, some of them out of amusement out of amusement. So you know the very first instruction in the instruction set is the AAA instruction, which is the ASCII adjust AL register after addition that's used with unpacked binary coded decimal arithmetic in the old 16-bit instruction set that's still supported. And at this point you start pulling your hair out, really. It's pretty horrendous. Uh, more typical though is the add instruction. And here we've got, uh, you know, adding two values together uh, where we've got uh, D is the destination, and S is a source. Uh, D and S can be a register, an immediate, a constant or a memory address. So that's kind of interesting, very different from uh, risk. So uh, it means that, you know, each of these different flavors of add execute in very different ways. And in particular, uh, you know, if you've got a, a memory to memory based operation, uh, you know, that's quite tricky to implement. Um, you know, we've got uh, we've got a move instruction that can be used to move things uh, from memory into registers or registers into memory. So there's no separate integer load and store instructions. And then there's, you know, quite uh, complex instructions for doing things like uh, looping. Uh, so loop while equal, for example. Now let's look at a modern RISC processor. Well, I say modern, but actually the ARM processor, which is widely deployed in phones and Raspberry Pis and many, many other devices. In fact, there are more ARM processors out there than Intel processors. Um, the original 32-bit uh, instruction set actually comes from uh, 1985. So it's uh, pretty old at this point, but as I say, still very much around. It's pretty typical RISC, uh, uh, though it's got 16 integer registers, um, except that register 15 is also the program counter. That's a bit of a curious one. So any integer instruction can cause a branch. Uh, all instructions are conditional. So uh, there's actually a, what's called a hidden condition codes register. So if you do some arithmetic, uh, there are condition codes like, you know, zero or negative and so on. And um, there is a bit mask in every instruction that makes it conditional on the uh, current state of the condition codes flags. Um, as well as single load and stores, there are also load and store multiple instructions, which are rather CISC like, although they do result in quite compact code. And for instance, um, you know, for a subroutine, uh, prologue and epilogue. So in the prologue, you're normally saving uh, registers, for example, and often also saving the um, return address. And the sort of uh, the epilogue, you know, what comes at the end of the subroutine call, you can do uh, a load multiple uh, that sort of mirrors the uh, store multiple at the beginning. Except when you uh, are restoring the return address, you could actually return store, restore the return address directly into the program counter. So that's kind of curious that you can actually do a load multiple that loads all the state back and does the subroutine return all in one instruction. As I said, rather cisc like um, Actually, comparatively late, really, ARM introduced a 64-bit instruction set. So that's only uh, about, you know, back in 2011, so nine years old. Um, it's got many similarities with uh, sort of MIPS and RISC-V and so on. It's got 32 integer registers. It's got a hidden program counter unlike the original 32-bit ARM instruction set. Um, it's got conditional branches, but also, you know, a conditional move instruction. And then all the other instructions are not conditional, unlike the 32-bit instruction set. It actually has a rich set of addressing modes, unlike uh, RISC-V. 
So, you know, addresses can be just specified by, by a register or a register plus an immediate or a register plus a register or a register that shifted and then summed to another register. And actually, this works very well when you're compiling uh, particularly object oriented code. And so you do tend to end up with more dense code than uh, for risk five. Now for something a bit different, let's have a look at Java bytecode. So this is an instruction set that is used when you compile Java. Uh, Java normally gets compiled into this intermediate bytecode form. This instruction set though is very much focused on portability. Uh, it's very much an intermediate representation and it's then usually interpreted or compiled into native code. Uh, somebody has attempted to build a Java bytecode processor, uh, but it really wasn't very fast at all. Uh, Arm actually uh, developed a sort of halfway house uh, called Drizilla, which was a bytecode execution decoder that executes around 95% of the instructions with all the slightly more complicated ones performed by an exception handler. And... Uh, that was quite successful actually for some early mobile phones where you didn't really have enough space to run a JIT compiler to actually turn the code into native code. Um, it seems to have been deprecated however since uh, ARM v7. Java bytecode is a stack based machine. Uh, so this is where you have a rather than a register file you have an operand stack values are pushed and popped from the stack. The top of stack is uh, a dependency for most instructions. Um, so this is a bit like having an accumulator machine, but it's a little bit more flexible because you can store more uh, recently used values. Um, nevertheless, because you tend to have this dependency on the top of the stack, it can very easily limit instruction level of parallelism. There are hidden registers for very specific functions like, you know, the program counter and the stack pointer and so on. So Java bytecode is a variable length instruction set, but actually it's very easy to decode. OK, the first byte is the instruction opcode, and then there are n bytes of operand that follow where n is very easily determined from the opcode. And so to give you some simple examples, uh, I add adds the top two integer items on the operand stack with the result pushed onto the stack. So that's kind of interesting. So that I add is just one byte instruction. And as you might imagine, um, actually this instruction set ends up being quite dense. And uh, so you have very compact code. And that's one of the um, things that the Java bytecode designers were after because they wanted to be able to ship, uh, ship um, uh, Java bytecode over the, the network. And so they wanted to keep programs small. Similarly, you've got F add, which is like I add, but for floating point numbers. Uh, if you want to do some sort of conditional brun uh, branch, then uh, you can do something like an if equal. So if the top of the stack is zero, then the program counter is uh, basically set to the program counter plus an index where that index is specified as part of the instruction as basically some extra bytes. Um, then you've got instructions like IA load which loads uh, an int an integer from an array where the array reference and index are popped from the stack. And then you've got more complicated operations like table switch which is useful for encoding case statements and it basically encodes a long jump table of jump targets of part of the instruction with a dynamic index determining which jump to perform. And on, say, risk 5 you would do something very similar using two instructions. You would basically load the target jump uh, from a table and then jump to that uh, the value held in that register. OK. Uh, I'll give you another example of a complex instruction. We've got new, which creates a new object of a, a type identified by a class referenced in the constant pool. So it's actually very quite a complex instruction. It's not really well suited for uh, simple pipelines. Um, 
And so, for instance, in the ARM Drazilla implementation, you know, new was basically implemented as an exception. And so some, a software routine was called to basically implement new. Uh, on RISC-V, this would be uh, replaced by many instructions, and it's basically some a sort of form of uh, you know a memory allocator. Now I'd like to finish off this lecture by giving a research highlight. Um, I've been working uh, with colleagues on uh, a security extension for processors called Cherry and we've designed a RISC-V variant, which, not too surprisingly, is referred to as Cherry RISC-V. Uh, this is very much a team effort. Um, my colleague, uh, Robert Watson, has been inspirational um, in this project, um, and he's very much led the sort of uh, uh, instruction set architecture and higher level and all the software layers. I very much led, you know, from sort of the instruction set down into the hardware. Uh, my colleague Peter Sewell has done a lot on verification, and Peter Neumann at SRI International has helped oversee all of the projects and uh, helped um, interface with the funders uh, over the uh, last 10 plus years of work. We've been working on this actually for a long time, since uh, 2010. Let me motivate the work. So our observation was that many security vulnerabilities exploit memory safety violations. And so we've had a lot of bugs like Heartbleed, Cloudbleed, WannaCry, StackClash, and many others. And these were all pretty crazy bugs. Uh, you know, WannaCry, for instance, impacted uh, the National Health Service and uh, you know, it prevented people being treated. You know, it had a major impact. Uh, Heartbleed um, was an attack on uh, TLS, which is used to secure web transactions. So it had a major impact on secure banking and all sorts of things. We just want to get rid of all of these problems. Now I'd like to specifically look at Heartbleed to give you a concrete idea of how some of these bugs come about. So Heartbleed is uh, a vulnerability in the TLS protocol used to protect web transactions. The main uh, protocol and the crypto were completely sound. Okay, that's an interesting take home. However, uh, there was a, just a little side bit to the protocol that sent a heartbeat message between the client and the server. And it was used to basically keep the link alive uh, during transactions. And it was that that had the vulnerability in it. So let's see how this operates using an XKCD cartoon. So uh, to begin with, here we are, we've got the client saying, uh, server, are you still there? Uh, if so, reply potato. Oh, and potato six letters. Sure enough, the server says potato. And the client says, hmm, OK, you're still there. So if so, reply bird, four letters. And, you know, the server says bird, no problem. And then the client gets a bit too clever and says, oh, server, are you still there? Say, um, say hat. By the way, hat is 500 letters long. And lo and behold, what does the server say? The server says hat. And then you get lots of other information. And this is an example of a uh, buffer overread bug where basically uh, lots of the stack was uh, just read off, including all sorts of uh, secret information. And that allow you to break into the system. This is nuts, right? We shouldn't allow this sort of thing. So what went wrong and how can we do better? Well, the classical answer is stupid programmer. The programmer forgot to check the bounds of the data structure being read. And actually, the fix to the vulnerability in C is the following one line fix. OK, it basically just checks the length uh, matches up. Our answer, however, is to preserve the bounds information during compilation. And we want to use hardware so the Cherry extended processor to dynamically check the bounds with little overhead. And we also want other properties like guaranteed pointer integrity and provenance. 
I'll give you another example. We'd like to be able to reduce the attack surface. So, so the software attack surface just keeps getting bigger. You know, we keep designing bigger and bigger applications. We've got lots of memory in machines. Of course, to do rapid development, we use huge libraries of code. And also, everything is now network connected. And all of this really aids an attacker. You know, the, it, the expanding attack surface is just expands the number of ways to break in. So our Cherry solution is to really apply the idea of uh, application level least privilege, or really fundamentally the idea of the um, minimizing privilege in the system. And you can do so using a technique called software compartmentalization to decompose software into isolated components that uh, you delegated limited rights to. And quite critically with this, you, if you do compartmentalization really well, you can mitigate not only uh, known vulnerabilities, but also unknown vulnerabilities, and even uh, as yet undisclosed classes of vulnerabilities and exploits. And to give you an example of how this work might work in practice, you know, every time uh, you render a web page, if you've got something like a Chrome browser, uh, it will attempt to do that in a separate process to give you some level of compartmentalization so it sits in its own virtual address space. However, you, there's a limited number of virtual address spaces you can support efficiently without really thrashing the TLB. And uh, so if you've got a lot of tabs open on the Chrome browser, they start sharing component compartments and unfortunately that could result in, you know, you looking at Facebook also interacting with your banking app, which is bad news. We want to be able to go even further than that, though. Not only do we want every tab to be in a compartment, we want, you know, every image rendered to be rendered in a separate compartment. We want every bit of JavaScript to be in a separate compartment and so on. And Cherry allows us to do that. So really we want to uphold uh, two principles. The first of them is the principle of intentional use. So we want to ensure that software runs the way the programmer intended, not the way the attacker tricked it, okay? And our approach is basically to have guaranteed point of integrity and provenance with very efficient dynamic bounds checking. And this will get rid of all sorts of problems that are classic problems like buffer over read, buffer overflow uh, type vulnerabilities. We also want to apply the principle of least privilege. So we want to reduce the attack surface using software compartmentalization to mitigate both known and unknown vulnerabilities. And the approach is to basically provide highly scalable and highly efficient compartmentalization primitives in hardware that software then can build uh, complex structures on top of us. So how does Cherry work? Well, it fundamentally adds a new data type we call the capability. And a Cherry capability is a bounds checked pointer with integrity. It's held in memory uh, and in new or extended registers. Okay, so if we start off with an integer uh, address, an integer pointer, so on a 64-bit machine, that's a 64-bit value. To that, we then add permissions some bounds information that are compressed. So we've basically got top and bottom bounds and we add an S bit that I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. So we're going to turn our pointers into uh, from 64 bits into 128 bits. And we also add a 129th bit hidden validity tag that uh, asserts the integrity uh, of the pointer. So that uh, pointer basically points to somewhere in virtual address space and the bounds information give us the top and bottom of uh, the object that it refers to. We then add some new instructions. So we have new instructions to do memory access, in particular new loads and stores via these bounds check capabilities. And we get an exception if the address is out of range during dereference. We add some instructions to do uh, guarded manipulation of capabilities. Okay, so we um, this is the only way of uh, manipulating the capabilities. If you try to just 
uh, overwrite a capability, for example, using a normal integer load or store instruction, then the uh, validity tag gets cleared and it's no longer a capability. Similarly, if you try to do some sort of integer arithmetic with a capability, it just gets turned into an integer. It's no longer a capability. So if you want to preserve it as a capability, you have to use the capability specific instructions and they only allow you to decrease the bounds, decrease permissions, adjust the address and extract the field. And for example, uh, decreasing in bounds and permissions gives us basically monotonic decrease in write. And that's so important, we've actually done formal verification work to ensure that that um, security property is maintained no matter what program you construct. We also have a sealed version of the capabilities that is used for compartmentalization. These sealed capabilities are non-dereferenceable. In other words, you can't just use them as a pointer directly. And they have to be unsealed, uh, typically inside a compartment, before they can be used. So to our capability, we add an object type, which is 24 bits. We further compress the bounds information, and we set the sealed bit to 1. And using uh, sealed data and code capabilities, we can describe a compartment. So the code capability refers to the block of instructions that we're going to execute, and the sealed data capability refers to the data region that that compartment is going to operate on. Then we have a C call function, which basically compares the object types, and if they match, then it will uh, unseal the capabilities and then run the code pointed to by the program counter capability and that code can then reference data via the default data capability. There's much more about this uh, that you can read about if you're interested in. Um, just uh, have a look at our web pages but uh, we don't really have time in this lecture to go much further. So to summarize, uh, Cherry's memory-based capabilities guarantee pointer provenance and integrity. In other words, you can't just magic a pointer out of thin air and they guarantee that you can only derive you know, uh, a smaller capability basically from a bigger capability. It allows the <coughs> compiler to encode bounds and permissions information, which means that you can auto automatically mitigate uh, buffer overflow and buffer overrun or overread attacks. And it pushes us towards the principle of intentional use. In other words, once we've compiled the code, it's much more likely to execute the way the programmer intended, because basically we've encoded more of the semantic information from the original program in the final uh, binary executable. Um, and we think that's an incredibly powerful thing to do. The uh, basic uh, hardware primitives uh, support compartmentalization, on top of which many software models can be built. And this really pushes us towards the principle of least privilege, because we can build software systems that do very extensive compartmentalization at very low cost. And a note that I've added to the slide uh, I'm delighted to say that ARM is building a Cherry ARM prototype system on chip. Uh, so this is a you know a cutting edge chip on a six nanometer process with high end uh, multiprocessor 64 bit cores, and uh, the board that it will go on will be called Morello. That should be due at the end of 2021. Uh, this is in part funded by industry, but also uh, UK government via the D Digital Security by Design uh, Innovate UK initiative. I hope you've enjoyed the first 10 lectures of this course exploring the architecture of single processors. For the remaining six lectures, we're going to explore system on chip design, including multiprocessors and graphics processing units.